Hello, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Today's Bible study is going to be on Elijah. That's E-L-I-J-A-H. He was an Old Testament prophet. Matter of fact, his life to me is just one of the most interesting in the whole Bible. Um, Elijah was, it's just, I don't know. To me, it's, it's, he was an incredible prophet. And we might actually get to see him before we leave this earth. All right, I'm going to kind of gloss over a lot of stuff because you could make this a two-hour study easily. Um, maybe even longer. I don't know. Elijah did a lot of stuff. All right, in 1 Kings 17, chapter 17 and verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, now that's King Ahab, by the way. And he says, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So there was, um, Elijah went to King Ahab. And for those of you that don't know it, there's a verse in the Bible where King Ahab did more evil than all the kings that were before him. I mean, Ahab really, I guess you could say in modern terminology, he PO'd God big time. I mean, Ahab was just plain evil. Okay, matter of fact, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 30, and Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Wow. Okay. So, it's definitely not good. All right, so let's continue with Elijah. So Elijah's con um, confronting this evil king Ahab, okay? And let's continue. All right, so Ahab spoke as the Lord commanded him to, and there was to be a drought in Israel. Okay? And Elijah met a, a woman, and she had a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour left. I think she was a widow. And you can read about this in verse 13, 1 Kings 17, verse 13. So here it is, there's a big drought, there's no, there's no wheat, you know. And this woman's getting ready to make her last cake. Not, not cake as we know it, but um, like a piece of bread, a cake of bread, okay? If you look up the word cake, it doesn't necessarily mean dessert, okay? Um, back in the older days, um, it was kind of like a cracker, okay? So, here it is, he goes, Elijah's talking to the woman. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, 
and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. Okay? Verse 15. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. Okay? So this woman had just a little bit of food, not even enough for her and her son, but she made a cake of bread for Elijah because she believed he was a prophet of God, and she did as he said, trusting in him and the Lord. And she made him a little piece of bread, brought it to him, okay? And let's read verse 16. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So here it is. There's a drought in Israel. There's no food. And this woman didn't even have enough food for her and her son. And here it is. You got this prophet saying, oh, well, make me a little, a little tiny cake and bring it to me first. And she did it. And her, uh, her ba a barrel of, of wheat, wheat meal, never went empty. And the container of, I guess it was olive oil, it never went dry. Isn't that something? Now, two verses later, the woman's son, he dies. Okay. Okay. Uh, First Kings seventeen seventeen, and it came to pass after these days that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. He quit breathing. Okay. He died. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come? unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son. See, this is something the Lord likes to hear from us. That we acknowledge that we have sin. Okay? Now, once you become the Lord's, you should try to get sin out of your life as much as possible. Um, I don't know. I mean, none of us are ever going to reach sinless perfection in the flesh. But as much as possible, we should li try to live a holy and righteous life. Okay, but she, this woman acknowledged that she was a sinner. Okay? So her son died. Her son dies, Okay? Now, verse 19, And he, Elijah, said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil unto the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? Okay. So here it is. This woman brought the prophet of God, into her house, let him stay with her, fed him, and her son dies. Okay? So she's, you know, a widow, I mean, a widow's, widow life was rough. I mean, here it is, she had to take care of the house, take care of a kid, go out into the field, take care of the crops, okay? A widow's life was rough. So she probably had almost nothing for her and her son, but yet she takes the prophet of God into her house and feeds him and takes care of him. You know, she probably, like I said, didn't even have enough for her and her son, and she's taken another mouth to feed. Okay? And Elijah, 
And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he, he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. You know, sometimes the Lord lets things happen that look bad, but it's actually to give us faith and to prove that he is true. Okay? There's a verse in the Bible that says, oh, well, let's see, hold on. Yeah, I was looking for one verse and I found another. Wow, this is this is something I, I love when I start doing these uh, studies I find things it's like every time you open up the Bible you'll find something new even though you've probably read the same thing ten times you'll find something new every time you go through the Bible Psalms 70 verse 4 let all those that seek thee and that's seeking the Lord let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee and let such as love thy salvation say continually let God be magnified okay uh, Romans 8 28 okay think about the woman and and the widow and her son and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Okay? That is definitely a powerful verse. All right, so. Uh, let's see. All right, if you skip to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Okay? Um, you know, a lot of this stuff happens in the Old Testament. And it foreshadows the things that will happen in the New Testament. And a lot of Christians are really foolish. They try to explain the Old Testament with the New Testament. And you got it backwards. you got to explain the New Testament with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the foundation. The New Testament is the walls and the roof, the covering, the end. Okay? Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. Okay? But if you don't have a foundation in the Old Testament, you can find salvation in the New Testament alone, faith in Christ, uh, contrary to those idiots uh, running around YouTube saying the Bible is the mark of the beast. Uh, of course, if they're talking about the new modern Bible versions like the NIV, um, I agree with them. That Bible is the mark of the beast, but they say all Bibles are the mark of the beast. Um, you know, they're, well, you know who they work for. Okay? But in the Great Tribulation, it's supposed to last three and a half years, um, This could be a foreshadow, okay? There was no rain for three years, okay? Can you imagine? No crops for three years, okay? Verse 2, 
And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. Now Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And you know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, Judah and Israel is the same thing. Uh, they're not. The capital of Judah was Jerusalem. The capital of Israel, the northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes, was Samaria. Okay? They went into apostasy first. Okay? So, all right, let's skip to verse 7. Now, there was a servant of Elijah by the name of Obadiah. I'm not sure, I don't think it was the same Obadiah as in the Bible, uh, the book by that name, The Minor Prophets. But um, Obadiah was searching for some grass and water for the king's horses. All right, verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and he fell on his face and said, Art thou that, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go, tell my, thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. Okay? So, when you keep reading, um, Obadiah was worried that, you know, he's going to go back and tell the king that Elijah's here. And uh, he was worried that Elijah would take off, then the king would be mad at Obadiah because he either lied to him or, you know, whatever. Okay, verse 14. Uh, let's see. So, he says, And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him this day. So, you know, Elijah was kind of hiding from uh, Ahab because Ahab wanted to kill, King Ahab wanted to kill this prophet of God, okay? And this that happened a lot. Matter of fact, the Jews in Jerusalem killed a lot of the prophets too, okay? I mean, not just... Israel, but Judah too. All right, uh, verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Okay. So Ahab is blaming the drought and all the problems of Israel on Elijah. Next verse. And he, Elijah, answered and says, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now, Balaam's a um, Baal or uh, Baal, B-A-A-L, is a word, it means Lord. And it used to be a, a name for the God of Israel. But it became so commonly used with Satan worship that the Lord actually says not to call him Baal anymore. I mean, that's pretty sad, really, you think about it. All right, if you turn to uh, Hosea, Okay, chapter 2, verse 13. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself in her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgat me, saith the Lord. Okay, verse 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, thou sh uh, that thou shalt call me, Ishai, and shall call me no more Balai. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered 
by their name. Okay, so Baal, Baalai, Balaam, um, just another way of saying Satan. Not good at all. Okay? So Ahab was into Baal worship, which is it's modern day Satanism. Okay? Which is very prevalent. Matter of fact, I was into the um, New Age movement for a while. And it's sort of kind of baby Satanism. I mean, a lot of the adherents to the New Age, they don't see it that way until they get deep into it. Okay? It's kind of like taking baby steps, you know? Um, because that's what Satan will do. He'll give you some baby steps until you get comfortable with that. And then he'll give you more and more and more until you're sacrificing your children on an altar to Satan. It's horrid. But, you know, today they've got all these movies out, TV shows about dragons and vampires and good witches fighting bad witches and Harry Potter and you know it's just it's amazing honestly I I think there are more a lot more people into witchcraft than there are true Christians in this world right now uh, that's my opinion I could be wrong but um, it's pretty crazy all right so here it is Elijah has come back to face Ahab, who was King Ahab was trying to kill Elijah. Okay? And he is going to issue a challenge, an ultimatum to all of Israel and to the king of Israel, which is Ahab. And by the way, the king of Israel was a different person than the king of Judah. Okay, they actually fought wars against each other. I know the modern church says Israel and Judah, Jews and Israel is the same thing, but they're, they weren't not in the book of Kings. And uh, most churches will actually tell you, oh, don't read the Old Testament. It, it, it's a waste of time. Uh, that book's for the Jews. It's not for you. We're Christians. We're New Testament Christians. Don't read the, the Old Testament book. That's for the Jews. I've actually had them tell me that. And I say that with a southern accent because I, uh, I actually moved to Tennessee to be with a church. And I had a pastor actually tell me almost that exact same thing. It wasn't long before I left, but... Uh, or did they throw me out? I, I don't remember. But uh, All right. Let's see what we got now. The Elijah, Elijah challenges the prophets of the priests of Baal. Those people worshipping Satan. All right. So, 1 Kings 18.19, Elijah says, to King Ahab, king of Israel. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. Okay. And the prophets of Baal, 450, and prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So the prophets of this Satanism are 450, and the prophets of the groves, people don't know it, but the, um, the groves refers to where they would do human sacrifices among the trees. Uh, so when you read in the Bible about the groves, they serve the groves, G-R-O-V-E-S. That's what they're talking about. And uh, matter of fact, in medieval Germany, before Christianity spread, they, you know, they they were talking about spirits of the forest. So, this is actually a very, very old concept. 
okay? And Jezebel was Ahab's wife, Queen Jezebel, okay? So, Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel. Now, obviously, all here is a figure of speech because you're not going to have a, a million people hanging out at this place. So, you know, sometimes all means all, but sometimes all is a figure of speech, okay? So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. In other words, they kept quiet. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, okay? And I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answer, answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Okay, so in other words, they're saying, good idea, okay? So here it is, they're going to take a bowl, put it on wood, and they're not going to light it on fire. They're going to have to have fire come down from God. Okay? And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, verse 25, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So here it is, they're crying. They're jumping up and down. Okay? Nothing happening. Now, this is not to say that Satan doesn't have any power. Oh yeah, he does. But the thing is, the Lord can stop him. The Lord's more powerful. So everything Satan does has to be in God's will, or God has to allow him to do it. Okay? Verse 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. Wow, how's that? He's saying, oh, gee, maybe uh, maybe your God's sleeping and you got to wake him up. Okay, verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. You ever hear about people cutting themselves with knives? This is not a new practice. It has to do with Satanism. So if any of you parents got a kid that cuts themselves, you got a problem. And it came to pass, verse 29, and it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So here it is, they went from the evening to noon, and here it is, it's evening. That there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. 
And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob. And by the way, the, those of you who don't know it, Jacob was the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Okay, So Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Okay, two measures of seed. I mean, that's... I don't know exactly how big it is, but... Um, it's a pretty good amount of water. I mean, you know, it's probably a couple buckets full. Verse 33. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Okay. So here it is. Elijah's taking water and pouring it on the wood. Okay. That's not real good if you're looking to make a a fire right and he said do it the second time and they did it the second time and he said do it the third time and they did it the third time okay um, not to get into numerology which a lot of that stuff's Satanism but if you'll notice there are certain numbers that pop up in the Bible over and over and over one three six seven 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 24, and 40. Those verses, those numbers pop up in the Bible a lot. So you notice he took the water and poured it on the altar three times. Okay? And I don't like using the word Trinity because it's not in the Bible, but the word Godhead is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Maybe that's what, why it was three times. I don't know. Okay, verse 35. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Okay? Um, I've had, one time I had a woman who uh, told me that didn't matter what name you called God, and didn't matter what religion you were, that, you know, all roads lead to heaven. Um, you know, doesn't matter what name you call God, doesn't matter to the religion because they all lead to the same place. And I asked her, do Christians and do Satanists and Luciferians, do they all worship the same God? And she kind of looked at me puzzled and, uh, she says, well, I, 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 I guess not. Okay. What I like is Elijah said, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's in Genesis. That tells you very plainly which God we're talking about. The God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. That's the God of the Bible. No doubt about it. Okay? Okay. All right, verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know, may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. Listen carefully, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and even licked up the water that was in the trench. So here it is, Elijah poured water on the wood, 
fire comes down from the sky and devours everything. The sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even the water that was in the trench. Verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And this is what we're supposed to do with Satanists. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Okay? So, Elijah called for drought. And there was drought. Elijah called for rain, and there's rain. Elijah called for fire from the sky, and there's fire from the sky. Verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. So evidently, Elijah's got a prophet in training or a servant. I don't know. Verse 44, And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezebel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Okay. Um, for those of you that don't ca didn't catch it, the king wasn't walking. The king had horses. So Ahab, by the way, by the will of the Lord outran the king's horses. Okay? So, here it is. The king's going back to Jezreel. Elijah beats him there. Outran the horses. Okay? And now he's going to confront the people, children of Israel. All right, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. All right, so Ahab gets home, tells his queen, his wife, Jezebel. Well, let's read it. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Okay? So, Ahab, uh, Elijah tells his wife that uh, Elijah had killed all of her prophets. Okay. Then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So, here it is. Jezebel's threatening to kill Elijah. Okay. All right, skip to verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Okay. Lord's asking, What are you doing? Well, let's back up a little bit. All right, so Elijah, uh, Jezebel threatens Elijah. Okay, verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. So he's running for his life. 
and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So here it is, uh, Elijah leaves Israel, goes to Judah, which are not the same, contrary to what the churches teach, okay? Because Ahab was king of Israel, not king of Judah, all right? Verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. You ever heard of Touched by an Angel? That's an old TV show, but this is the real deal. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. Okay? Um, there's probably none of you that are clinical psychologists. I'm not either. But here it is. He wants to die. And he's sleeping. This is a sign of depression. Elijah was depressed. Because I, what I think he was depressed about is he showed great things unto the children of Israel. The people acknowledged the Lord God as God. But where was the revival? You know, people look at it, it's a show, and the next day nothing's changed. Okay? All right, so let's see. All right, 1 Kings 19.7, next verse. And the angel of the Lord came again. The second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Did you catch that? He ate and drank, and because he had eaten, he was able to go forty days and forty nights. Okay? Um... Contrast that to, um, hold on a second here. If you uh, read in Genesis 7, you'll see that um, 40 days and 40 nights it rained on the earth in the days of Noah. Okay. And uh, let's see. If you read in Deuteronomy, um, chapter 9, Moses fell down 40 days and 40 nights to plead for the children of Israel because God was going to destroy them because they had gotten into idolatry with Aaron so quick. Okay? Um, I remember I told you 40 pops up a lot. Well, here it is again. Um, in the book of Jonah, Jonah warned the king of Nineveh that in 40 days that Nineveh would be overthrown, and they fasted, okay? In Matthew 4, verse 2, um, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? And uh, if you read Mark 1, when uh, he was in the wilderness 40 days, he was tempted to Satan. Okay. And, um, yeah, so, you know, 40 pops up over and over and over and over and over. All right, so, Elijah went in from the strength of that meal for 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the Mount of God. 
And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing? Verse 10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Okay? Remember that. There's people running around like, um, oh, that big fat guy out in uh, San Antonio, Texas, um, says God's co God made a covenant with the Jews, and it uh, doesn't matter what the Jews do, they're going to be saved even without Jesus. Um, I think you know who I'm talking about. But the thing is, the children of Israel had forsaken the covenant of God. God had made a covenant with them. A covenant is a contract. Okay? God kept his end of the bargain. But the children of Israel didn't keep their part of the bargain. A contract is a two-way street. When you go to buy a car, the car dealer says, Hey, you pay us for this car, we give you the car. Okay? car dealer wants to give you the car, okay? The Lord wanted to give the covenant to Israel, but Israel didn't pay the price. They were supposed to keep God's commandments, okay? They didn't do it, okay? It was Israel that broke God's covenant. God didn't break his covenant. The children of Israel broke the covenant, the contract, okay? All right, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of, of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars. Okay, they took the altars of God and they destroyed them, and slain thy prophets with the sword. These people killed the prophets of God. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Okay? Elijah thinks he's the last and only one. He's depressed. And he said, the Lord, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passeth by, and with a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after fire, after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, Syria, Okay, Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou appoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, E L I S H A, not Elijah, Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimelah, Abel, A-B-E-L-M-E-H-O-L-A-N, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy stead. So, Hazael is going to be king of Syria. Jehu is going to become king of Israel. I guess he's going, he's going to depose Ahab. And Elisha, Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A, is going to be the prophet instead of Elijah. 
Uh, it gets a little confusing. Verse 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth by the sword, uh, that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him, him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. All right, so the king of Syria is going to go to Israel and kill, go to war. And those that escape that, the new king, Jehu, is going to slay, kill. And those that escape those two things, the new prophet is going to kill them. Verse 18. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. Okay, out of the millions in Israel, there's only 7,000. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. Wow. So he departed the fence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Now the mantle was like a, uh, I don't know exactly how to put it, it's sort of like a, it's a piece of clothing that you wear around your shoulders, and it was the clothing of a prophet. All right, so Elisha, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I to do to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh for the instruments with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. How's this for burning your bridges? He took the yoke of oxen that he used for plowing the, the field for his family killed them, cooked them, and cooked them with the uh, the plow, the wood of the plow. I mean, that's, that's what you call burning your bridges, right? All right, so let's go to chapter 20. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, if you... Uh, skip along you could read the next couple chapters of first kings and you can read about jezebel and the wars that israel had with syria okay now you turn to second kings chapter one and first chapter one all right so, there's a battle. Ahab gets killed in the battle. And we read, Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Um, remember when the Jews told Jesus that uh, he cast out demons by Beelzebub? Well, this is who they're talking about, the God of Ekron. But the angel of the Lord said, un said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub? the God of Ekron. Now therefore thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up. 
but shall surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? They're talking about the king here, you know. And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that thou sentest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. All right, now the king's replying to them. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an, an hairy man and girth with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. And the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. Okay, so here it is. The king sends, sends a, a, a troop of 50 people after this guy, his, you know, captain of his army. Let's continue. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a an hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, uh, well, before I continue, um, when the king of Israel that's into evil sends 50 troops, 50 of his military, and a captain after you, uh, it's not a good thing. I mean, they're not, you know, the king of Israel's not... Uh, going to invite him to dinner, okay? They're trying to capture him, possibly kill him, okay? All right? It's not a good, this is not a good thing. When the king of Israel, who's evil, sends 50 troops after you, uh, it's not a good thing, okay? So, let's continue. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, then let fire, fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he, the king of Israel, sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. All right, so that's twice. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came down fire from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord came unto Elijah. I'm sorry. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shall surely die. So he died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken, 
and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Okay. So, the point I'm trying to make here is Elijah could call down fire from the sky and burn up those that wanted to kill him. All right? I want you to think about that for a second. You know, in uh, the book of Luke, 9th chapter 54, we read this of Jesus' disciples. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, all right, they came from a city, right, that or a town that uh, basically didn't want to hear them and kicked them out, okay? And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Okay? And uh, Jesus rebuked them, basically, and, you know, he says, you know, you don't know what manner of man I am. You know, but they knew full well that they could command fire to come down from the sky. Okay? Now remember something. Sodom and Gomorrah were, it rained down fire and destroyed them. Right? So... First time the earth was destroyed, it was destroyed in a flood. Second time, it's going to be destroyed by fire. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, we read, In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1 7 we read, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Um a lot of people don't know it, but Elijah and Enoch are the only two people in the Bible that never died. Okay? Elijah and Enoch. Now there's uh, two Enochs in the Bible. There's the one descended from Seth and then there's the other one descended from, uh, I think it's Canaan. No, that's not a good one. All right, now, we read in Genesis uh, 5, 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Now, for those of you that don't know it, uh, Methuselah was probably, I think, Methuselah was the longest living person in the Bible, 965 days or something like that. Okay? And after Methuselah died, that's when God brought the flood of Noah. Okay? Next verse. Genesis 5.22 And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Verse 23. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Enoch lived a year for every day in a year. I mean, you know, there's 365 days in a year. He lived 365 years. Is that significant? I don't know. Verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Okay? And for a second witness, 
Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For, but for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So there's your second witness. And in Jude, um, we read, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. So, Enoch is one of only two people that never died. All right, so let's get back to Elisha. All right, go to Second Kings chapter two, and you know when I was in Bible college, um, I had to do a, at least one report on any Bible character I wanted, and. This is who I picked. I picked Elijah. Um, you know, a lot of people would have picked Jesus. But for me, Elijah was just a um, really, really interesting character. All right. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Okay? So Elijah's got a student, a prophet in training. I'm going to call him Elisha. So you got Elijah and Elisha. Okay? And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here. I pray here. Tarry means wait. For the Lord hath sent me to Bethel, and uh, Beth means house, El. Bethel means house of God. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. So here it is, Elijah told him to wait. And Elisha says, Nope, I'm going with you, buddy. I'm not going to leave you. Or you're not going to leave me. I'm going with you. So they go down to Bethel, house of God. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. In modern English, that would be, Yeah, yeah, I know. Keep quiet. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it, hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and the two stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, that was the uh, clothing of a, of, of a prophet, a mantle, okay? Um, if you've ever watched, uh, you know, you see priests wearing, you know, special clothing. Well, that's what a mantle was. It was a uh, type of a cloak, an outer garment. And uh, it, you know, it would make, mark a man that, as being a prophet of the Lord. You know, life of a prophet was not 
an easy life, you know. They didn't live in the king's palace. Um, when the world was doing evil, the prophet would tell everybody that, you know, God's judgment's coming. Prophets were never, never very popular. Matter of fact, the Bible even records how, um, how the Jews had killed all their prophets. You know? And, um, you know, seriously, the Jews killed almost all their prophets. You know? I mean, they had Jesus killed, too. So, you know, what can I tell you? All right, so let's continue. All right, so... Um, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote, he struck the waters, smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So Elijah basically did what Moses did. He, you know, when he, Moses struck the Red Sea and it parted and they walked across dry ground, Elijah did the same thing. 2 Kings 2.9 and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask, what shall I do for thee before I be taken away from thee? So here it is, the prophet's asking his student, What can I do for you? And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of my spirit, of thy spirit, be upon me. Wow. In other words, what you got, I want double. You know, you got one scoop of ice cream, I want a double dipper. So, and he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken away, when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha, Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha, Elisha went over. So, here it is, the prophet Elijah. We don't even know who his parents were. He appears on the scene, and he disappears from the scene. He goes up into heaven in a whirlwind of fire on a chariot with driven by horses of fire. Can you imagine when the Lord finally does come back on horses of fire? Maybe? I don't know. All right. So, Elijah goes up into heaven, you know, with Enoch. The only two people in the world that have never died. Um, are we going to ever see Elisha again? Elijah? Are we going to see him? I don't know. Let's see what the good book says. Um, in Malachi 4.5, we read, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So here it is, 
this minor prophet of Israel says that Elijah is going to come before the coming of the great and dread, dreadful day of the Lord. Now, when they're talking about a dreadful day of the Lord, that's not for believers. That's for the unbelievers. When the Lord comes back for these unbelievers, it's going to be a dreadful day. But before the Lord comes back, Elijah's going to come. All right? So, Elijah is probably one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation that confronts the false prophet, the false prophet and the beast, the Antichrist beast. Hold on here a second. You know, when you uh, read about in John chapter 1, okay, verse 19, and this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Okay, the Jews send priests and Levites from Jerusalem, and they're asking him, Who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Okay? And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And that's the Greek rendering of the word Elijah. And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? And John said, and he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. So here it is, John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Okay? So, what did Jesus have to say about John the Baptist? All right, you know what Jesus said about John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11? Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Okay? If you want to read something interesting, go to Matthew 17. Okay? Um, all right. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went to a mountain and was transfigured before them. And then in verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Okay? So here it is, Moses and Elijah appeared before Jesus. Now Moses was a, of the tribe of Levi. He was of the priest tribe. He represented the law. You know, Moses got the Ten Commandments, the law. And Elijah, well, it's rendered Elias, but that's the Greek rendering of Elijah. He represented the prophets. So you had the law and the prophets, okay? And... Uh, Make, uh, let's keep going, okay? Verse 9. And, okay, then uh, after, you know, Jesus is there with the Moses and Elijah, um, then they are gone. Okay. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? Okay? So, here it is. Elijah did come. Okay? Before the day of, uh, you know, Christ. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they 
listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Okay? John the Baptist denied being Elijah, Elias. Okay? So, is this making sense? I hope so. So, Elijah, Elias, he's going to come back again. And my opinion is he's one of the two witnesses. Uh, maybe with Moses, because he was transfigured with Moses. Some say Moses. Other people say that the second of the two witnesses is going to be Enoch, which I, I'm kind of partial to that, but, you know, Bible doesn't say, so it's just a guess. And uh, I hate guessing about things in the Bible because I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again. So, let's read about the two witnesses. All right, turn your Bibles to Revelation 11. And... Um, Verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, the nations. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's basically three and a half years. Um which is the amount of time that Jesus spent on the earth um, in his ministry. Listen carefully. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Okay, so that's about 42 months, three and a half years. Okay. Um... Personally, I think the time of sorrows is when the two witnesses show up. They go three and a half years. They're killed. The beast will enter the temple of God proclaiming that he is God. And I believe that is the beginning of the start of the Great Tribulation. You have seven years of tribulation, and then you have the Great Tribulation. Um, if anybody's interested, I could go into this in more detail. I'm sure some of my other studies have gone into this, too. Um, but that's my opinion. I believe the two witnesses, um, they're going to smite the earth with a curse. Okay. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days sack in clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Okay? So they can open their mouth, bring fire down. Okay? These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Remember the days of Ahab? Uh, Elijah said it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. All right. And when they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Okay? So these two witnesses shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? You know, everybody wants to make this place out to be uh, Rome, uh, 
Mecca, Islam, or Istanbul, Turkey, you know, the Bible says that Jerusalem is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Okay? Well, that's the Bible, you know, but a lot of people don't care what the Bible says. They just insert their own opinions. I don't do that. I try not to do that. Okay, uh, verse 10. 9, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer or allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Sounds like Christmas time, huh? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Okay? So, these two witnesses, um, I think at least one of them is going to be Enoch. I mean, Elijah. Okay? Uh, because he does all the same things that Elisha does in the Old Testament. So, uh, one more point I'd like to make. Wow, I can't believe this. This Bible study is almost an hour and a half long. Crazy. Wow. All right, verse, uh, go to Revelation 13. You know, 13 is never, never a good number in the Bible. At least I haven't seen it. Um, Okay, uh, verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. There's those three and a half years again. Okay, um, so in the seven-year uh, tribulation, 40 and two months is three and a half years. That's about half of it. So um, I, think, I think all this happens after the two witnesses. That's my opinion. I could be wrong. Okay, verse 6. And he opened his, opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And I think those saints are Christians. Okay? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear... Let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. My interpretation, my opinion is that if it's your lot to be taken captive, to go into captivity, to you know be taken prisoner, you're to go. And if you resist them, if they're going to take you into captivity because you're a Christian, you're supposed to go peace peaceably, in peace. And if you resist them and, and you kill them, kill those fighting, trying to take you, you know, for being a Christian, that's the way you'll die. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, He that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Um, Christians don't live by the sword. You know, if somebody breaks in your house and wants to uh, kill your wife and rape your 12-year-old daughter, um, I'm not going to watch them and say, God bless you and hand them a condom, okay? Um, I'm going to take a 12-gauge and 
try to blow them into two pieces. I mean, that, that would, you know, but that's just me. Um, okay? But if you're supposed to go into captivity for your testimony of Jesus, you're to go in peace. And you're not to kill people trying to take you, okay? If they're trying to take you because of Jesus, you go. You don't kill them. Because if you if you shoot them and kill them, they're going to shoot and kill you. Okay, that's, that's, I believe, that is the correct interpretation of that verse. Okay, I could be wrong. Now, if they're just trying to kill you because... Um, you know, if you got a bunch of Chinese that want to kill you because you're white, um, you know, Chinese soldiers, that's another story altogether. But if they're rounding up Christians as being blas blasphemers and they want to kill them, for your testimony of Jesus, you're supposed to go in peace. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Um, talk about a wolf in sheep's clothing here. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes, causeth the earth and them which dwell in to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Listen carefully. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. This one is going to be able to mimic the miracles of Elijah, so he can bring fire down from the heaven, bring fire down from the sky on the earth, okay? And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the Im that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Okay? So... And he causeth all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of men, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Six hundred and sixty-six. Six, six, six. But everybody should know that. You know, it says the number of a man. Man was created on the sixth day of the week. Okay? Now, this this evil one that does his miracles by the power of the beast and the dragon, you notice he brings fire down from the sky just like Elijah. I know a lot of people are looking at the Pope. A lot of people are looking at uh, Muslims for the Antichrist. This is my opinion. I could be wrong. But I think the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. Just like Jesus picked Judas Iscariot. You know, Judas. Okay? Judas Iscariot. You know? He was a Jew. Satan entered into him. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, personally... That's what I think. I, you know, I don't know how Islam, Islam and uh, the Pope and all that are going to play into this mess, but I think ultimately the beast shall be a Jew, and his false prophet, the one that brings the fire down from the sky and does these miracles and wonders and these, you know, these miracles. I bet you that false prophet is going to claim that he's Elijah the prophet. You know, every year when the Jews have their Passover, the, the Bible-believing Jews anyways, 
they set their table with an extra plate and they set that for Elijah the prophet because they know that when he comes the Messiah shall come and the Jews have been waiting for their Messiah for you know 3,500 or so years maybe more okay ever since um, Israel was taken to captivity by the Assyrians and Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians ever since then the Jews have been waiting for their Messiah to come well Jesus came they didn't want him not all of them okay but generally as a for the most part uh, the majority of the Jews have rejected Jesus they didn't want him as the Messiah so they're looking for another Messiah and I think Satan's going to use this to give them what they want and you know most most of the Jews are going to be tricked now when they are um, when they have to worship the image of the beast you know the ones the truly um, the Jews that know the about you know not worshiping of idols I have a feeling some of those are gonna take a look at what you know the Bible says because Christians are gonna be dying and giving their testimony and there's probably you know some of the Jews are gonna realize oh hey we screwed up okay so you know if I was Satan that's what I would do I would make everybody think that um, this fault the, the false prophet who's doing these miracles bring a fire down from the sky have everybody believe have him say that he is Elijah come proclaiming the way for the for this the beast okay and saying even Christ has come okay in Matthew 24 the disciples asked Jesus tell us hey uh, paraphrasing here you know what's it gonna be like when you you know what's what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world Matthew 24 3 and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And deceive many. Okay? Verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Okay? You know, when Jesus comes back, he's going to be coming back in the clouds with glory with ten thousands of his saints and every eye is going to see him. Okay? I mean, there, there, there's not going to be no doubt. No doubt at all. Um... If you turn to Revelation 19.20, um, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. So you got the beast, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay, so you got the beast, the dragon, 
and the false prophet. All right, and the false prophet's going to be doing all the miracles, mimicking Elijah. So, um, I hope, and it's my prayer that you learn something from this Bible study and all blessings, praise, glory, and honor belongs to Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen.